Well, it's exactly 5 o'clock, so why don't we start on time? <laughs> I want to thank you all for coming. My name is John Raffanello, Italiano, Giovanni Raffanello. <laughs> My, uh, I was brought up uh, back east in Bristol, Connecticut, with a wonderful family. My mother was not Italian. She was uh, part Canadian and French and part American Yaqui Indian on my grandfather's side. But my father was very Italian, big Johnny Raff, and my mother learned to cook wonderful Italian food. As you can tell, this whole section here is devoted to Italian food. And the other section is devoted to ice cream and the desserts that my, uh, my mother and family used to pr produce. For over 40 years, actually quite a bit even longer than that, although I don't want to admit it, I've had the, I've been blessed to study with geniuses and crackpots all over the world, attempting to figure out which was which, <laughs> and eventually came to one kind of guideline to determine which was which. I figured that the geniuses made you feel good, and the crackpots made you feel lousy. <laughs> so I came down to that incredible simplicity. But first wisdom that came into my life actually came to me from my grandfather, Pliny Pratt, on my mother's side. He was from Wigville, Connecticut. Now, doesn't that sound like a great country town? <laughs> Pliny Pratt from Wigville, Connecticut. Right? And we used to go up to Grandma's house every Sunday. We would stop at uh, the Italian store and we'd get uh, ham and cheese and then rolls at the Harvest Bakery. Welcome, come on, Ali, and I'm just nice doing place. it. <laughs> come on, we got some seats over here on this side, and uh, I'm sure some of the people wouldn't mind you sitting on your lap, but for those who would like to volunteer for that, we got one over here. Come on in. Welcome, thank you. Your wife might have to sit on your lap. <laughs> Looks like we're going to get some floor space. Yeah. You got one here? Great. Okay, I was telling the story. In fact, I think I'll stand up for this since we've got a larger group here. My grandfather, Pliny Pratt, on my mother's side, was from Wigville, Connecticut. We used to go up every Sunday, and he taught me the very first wisdom that I ever learned in my life. Like I was telling people, I studied with geniuses and crackpots all over the world. We would go up every Sunday, and this one particular Sunday, Gramp was sitting on the porch smoking a pipe. He used to smoke those uh, white pipes, and he was petting the dog. And it was fall. I just got back from the fall in Connecticut, I, which is wonderful and beautiful. And there were leaves all over the ground, and I was out kicking leaves, as you can when you're a kid and you're all kind of excited and life is fun and you haven't been oppressed by many ideas of how your liberty is all messed up, you know, <laughs> before you get all of those sorts of things. And as I was kicking the leaves, I kicked this one pile of leaves, and underneath it was the biggest red lollipop that I had ever seen in my life. You know, one of these carnival ones with all the squirrels? Well, I picked it up and brushed it off and discovered that it was hardly used at all. <laughs> now, that was a great discovery for a kid, you know. Now, if my grandmother Nellie had seen that, all hell would have broken loose. She would not have subscribed to the hardly used philosophy, you know. <laughs> She figured I would have died from germs and had taken it away from me and we would have had some kind of an argument or maybe I'd be talking about her as an oppressive influence in my life in a libertarian talk. But as it was, my grandfather saw me with a lollipop. And although he had a philosophy very similar to my grandmother, didn't think kids should pick up lollipops off the ground even if they were hardly used, he looked away and he went back to petting the dog and smoking his pipe. So I kind of figured my lollipop was safe. So I roamed over next to him and I sat by him on the porch enjoying my lollipop. And he kind of waited and after a while, a little while, he was petting the dog and he kind of cocked his head 
and he looked over at me and he said, you know, if I had known that you had wanted to eat that lollipop, I would have told that dog not to pee on it. <laughs> now, as I got a little older, I really was impressed with that because here was a man who accomplished something, accomplished his objective in one line. That was my first introduction to workable technology. What actually works to accomplish the objectives that you have formulated? And that became one of the key things that I looked at as I studied with people all over the world. What actually works? to accomplish the objective, to clarify the objective and then see what works and hopefully what works cleverly and very rapidly. And that's what I've been looking for all over, all through my life. I talked my family, my bookie father and my mother into the idea that the colleges in California were much better, that Caltech had more Nobel Prize winners than any other university in the world that, and I wanted to go out to Caltech and get my my degree. The truth was I wanted to go to Disneyland <laughs> and work for Walt Disney, although that was also an objective and I did end up going to the university and got my first degree in space electronics and avionics and as I graduated was blessed to, to work on the guidance correction system for the Saturn moon rocket that they sent to the moon. So that was very exciting and then eventually got to work for Disney. I was hired, contracted actually, to do the Epcot project because the executives were scared to death that the project wasn't going to open on time. They had promoted a time when all of the dignitaries would come into Epcot. And I don't know if you remember Epcot. Walt's original concept was an experimental prototype community of tomorrow an actual community in which all sorts of philosophical and technological ideas and concepts would be worked out to create an ideal society, an ideal culture, one free from suppression and oppression of all kinds and shapes. It didn't become that, it became a theme park because the executives didn't know what, exactly how to pull that off. and. Uh, I think that we're now just learning how to be able to actually pull that off and make that the world into the uh, experimental prototype community that Walt wanted it to be. Well, when they called me into the Epcot project, like I said, they were scared to death it wasn't going to open. And the first thing I did was I went to head of, head of the scheduling department who scheduled everyone right down to the the people who did painted the railings and all the way up to the project managers themselves to ask him where the project was from his point of view. Come on in, folks. No, don't be shy. Everybody's going to be distracted by your entrance anyway. You know, boom. So we might as well call attention to it, right? Come on in. One here and lots of floor space. Here's one up here in front, if you like. Come on, right. You're most welcome. I went to the head of the scheduling department and the poor man was bent over his desk with a flow chart that was going out in all directions. I introduced myself and he didn't even look up. He just stuck out his hand like this and shook my hand. And I said to him, can you tell me where the project is at from your point of view? And again, he didn't look up. He just went like this. And I looked up and above his desk was a large poster done by one of the artists over at the studio and been beautiful grand calligraphy. It said, opening ceremonies Epcot. Showed a tractor pulling a pyramid of water skiers across the dirt lake. <laughs> That's where the project was at. <laughs> That's what they figured would be happening on opening day. What I did basically was I got people to enjoy themselves. The, what was going on, the reason they were so far behind was because they were very upset with each other. The creative department was very upset with the engineering department. Engineers were plugging things into concrete 
and the creators were changing them and you get vast upsets that occurred and I went to each individual one by one and said do you want to enjoy your day or do you want to be miserable you want to be happy and feel good or you want to feel rotten please choose rotten you got down already you don't need me <laughs> and of course they one by one some reluctantly chose to feel good and get along and I was blessed to apply techniques that I had learned over the years that enables you to be free no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what's going on in the culture, no matter what's going on in the reality. To be able to choose thoughts that make you feel good. In, in this movement, we see many, many things that tend to make us feel rotten. Why is this going on? This is horrible. This is horrible. That's horrible. We end up feeling rotten. Guess what? When we feel rotten, we're not very effective. We don't achieve our objectives very well. One of the things I learned from many philosophers was to learn to select thoughts that made you feel good. Visualize it being the way you want it to be rather than the way it is. There's a wonderful movie of the man of La Mancha, which I invite you to see. Peter O'Toole plays it, and it takes place during one of the most oppressive times in history. People are being tortured if they do not believe what they are supposed to believe, what the state, what the church told them to believe. And in this very suppressive, very oppressive environment, a man comes in and puts on a play ridiculing the Inquisition. Now, one either calls this incredibly courageous or intensely stupid, right? <laughs> and in the movie and in the play, they dramatize this. The man puts on this play with his sidekick and in comes the soldiers of the Inquisition and he's arrested and taken off to the dungeon. He's placed in a dungeon very scary dungeon to await the Inquisition. And when they pull up the ladder in this darkened dungeon, he's attacked by all of these people that have lived under tremendous suppression. They are not happy people. I see some of you right now not being really happy. And but when I said that, you smiled. <laughs> Sometimes when you indicate the truth, things change, you know. They're attacked in the dungeon and all their possessions are taken away. The trunk that contained all the props for the play because they have nothing. Talk about oppression. They have nothing. They have no freedom. The freedom to have a shirt, the freedom to have a pair of pants, a bright colored scarf. They tear them away. And Peter O'Toole is playing the principal part, is holding on to the manuscript of the man of La Mancha. And they're trying to tear it away from him. And he demands to have a trial. A trial in the dungeon to be allowed to keep his manuscript. <laughs> and the leader of the people thinks this is going to be a great idea. Let's have a trial. We, while we're waiting the Inquisition. So he points a prosecutor and a, and a jury and they begin the trial. And Peter O'Toole, as he's about to appoint a defense attorney, insists that he will defend himself, the fool. And as his defense, he does this amazing soliloquy. He says, I will impersonate a man. His name, Alonzo Quijana, a country gentleman, no longer young. Being retired, he has much time for books. And he reads them from morn till night and off through the night till morn again. And what he reads oppresses him. Sound familiar? He ponders the problem, how to make better a world where evil brings profit and virtue none at all. He lays down the melancholy burden of sanity. I love that line. He lays down the melancholy burden of sanity and conceives of the strangest project ever imagined, to become a knight errant and to roam the world in search of adventure, to raise up the weak and those in need. No longer will he be known as Alonzo Quijana, but a dauntless knight known as Don Quixote de la Mancha. And you go, the guy's nuts, right? 
he starts prancing around the dungeon singing, I am I, Don Quixote, the Lord of La Mancha, my destiny calls and I go, and the wild winds of fortune shall carry me onward, whithersoever they blow. Emotion, he's going for it, and I think that's what Stefan was talking about, we got to go for it. <laughs> All through the movie he's being oppressed. I invite you to see it, it's fantastic. One of the most amazing things is one of the final soliloquies. After he has been demonstrating, remember it was a conscious decision to see life as he wanted it to be. Not an insane decision, a conscious one. And the prosecutor is attempting to get him to face reality. Face reality! In our case, face that the government is oppressing us, that the Illuminati is... Children are taught a philosophy that it is their right and their duty to rule the rest of the world and to control them, and that is their mindset. oppression. He was being told by the prosecutor to face reality. Face life as it is. Are you crazy? You're dancing around here being, welcome Don Quixote. You're awaiting the Inquisition where it is likely you will be tortured slowly to death. Are you nuts? Face life as it is. And there's a soliloquy, I just love it. O'Toole just stops, he finally gets hit, he comes out, he's being Don Quixote, right? And then he goes, face life, isn't it? And he stops, and he says, life as it is? I have lived for over 40 years, and I have seen life as it is. Pain, misery, cruelty beyond belief. Moans from bundles of filth in the streets. I've seen my comrades die in battle, or more slowly under the lash of Africa. These were men who saw life as it is, but they died despairing. No glory, no brave last words, only their eyes filled with confusion, questioning why. I do not think they were asking why they were dying, but why they had ever lived. Who knows where madness lies, perhaps to be too practical, to see treasure where there is only trash, too much sanity, maybe madness, and maddest of all, to see life as it is and not as it should be. Isn't that beautiful? This is what I invite us to do. This is what I've learned from gurus all over the world, to see life as we wish it to be, not to ignore the reality that's in front of us, not to not do something about it. Accept what is there, do what you can, but see it as we wish it to be. I think that's one of the wonderful things about the Libertopia movement. We see it as we wish it to be, and when you see your life as you wish it to be, you're gonna be smiling. <laughs> Because you're not paying taxes. <laughs> if you're seeing it as you wish it to be, I doubt if any of you would be paying taxes, right? You're seeing re your relationship as wonderful. One of the things I, I learned from a great man of wisdom was that the only past that exists is the past that's in our mind. Do you remember coming in here, all of you? Yes, do you now? Come on, a little participation. Do you remember coming in here? Everybody who remembers coming in here, go, yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> You're alive. Yeah. Don't sit there letting it all come in at you. You'll die. It's like getting hit with a bullet, you know. <laughs> no matter how brilliant this stuff is, if you sit there like this, and then you're going to die. you got to put your attention out. Be alive. Alive. Really go. Everybody go, yeah. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Come on, go, yeah. yeah. Look, look around, everybody look around and see if you can find the dullest looking person in the room. Go. See, they all brighten up right away. <laughs> I'm not gonna be the dull one. Then you get live, liveness, liveness, right? See life as you wish it to be. That's what my Wonder Project is all about. I thought, wow, this is it. You know, wow. See, there's certain basic principles. 
Why do people do what they do? Why are these government people doing what they do? Why are the Illuminati people doing what they do? One, primarily, people do what they do because they think it will get them what they want. Right? They think if I do this, I'm going to get what I want. Right? If you oppose these people's viewpoint, if you oppose anybody's viewpoint, they will tend to defend it to the death. So opposing it doesn't work. Opposing it is war. It's good. You're warring with somebody's point of view. And it doesn't make any sense because it's their point of view. They created it. They're unique individuals. And whether you agree with it or don't agree with it, it's a created point of view. So how do you handle that? You admire it. Oh, nice point of view. Well, stupid, but you don't say that. Stupid, but it's a point of view. See? Because if you, you push against it, they'll defend it. You won't get anywhere. But if you validate it, what I call admire and retire. Oh, oh nice point of view. Very interesting. Yeah, I could see how you thought that out. Yeah, yeah very clever, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, New World Order uh, gained control of all the money in the world. Whoa, very clever. Nicely done. You are able to print all the money you want. Whoa, nicely done. Whoa, are you good? Yeah, yeah. You mean you got an army, a navy, marines, and they do exactly what you tell them to do? How did you pull that off? Brilliant. Whoa. <laughs> hey, they, you're not opposing it because it is brilliant. Whether it's evil or not, what's evil? I looked for the source definition of evil for years, finally found it in that Oxford Unabridged Dictionary, the one you got to read with a microscope, you know. It said, out of its proper bounds. I thought, what? Out of its proper bounds. Sat down and meditated on that. The sun is a series of thermonuclear reactions, hydrogen bombs. They provide all of our light, our heat, survival on Earth. Take one of those hydrogen bombs, put it in the middle of New York City, evil. Out of its proper bounds. Hey. We are all unique individuals. We are all brilliant individuals. When we are free, we get even more and more and more unique. All our points of view are valid. I learned that from an alien. I have an alien friend of mine. You want to talk about how weird I am? You have no idea. <laughs> right? He said, all situations are fundamentally neutral. No situation has built-in meaning. We add the meaning. You add a negative meaning, you're going to have a negative effect on yourself instantly. You're going to feel bad. If you add a negative meaning to anything, oh, the planet's going to hell. How do you feel immediately after that? Good? <laughs> Smile? Happy? <laughs> no. Oh, we're finally making it. Liber yeah, the libertarian movement is coming out. People are going to be free. Yeah, whoa, I feel in. Good. Positive meaning, positive effect on self instantly. Negative meaning, negative effect on self instantly. Right? What's the title? Living free and happy in an unfree world. You have the power. You have the power. Actually, how much power you have is unbelievable. I've seen people levitate things. Ooh. The power is unbelievable when you unsuppress yourself. But if you're saying the suppression is coming outside of me, there ain't nothing you can do about it. Because now you're putting it outside of yourself. I had clients come to me for 40 years. They come in, they got upsets like you wouldn't believe. People's ability to create upsets are marvelous, well-developed. They've been working on it for their entire life. They can get an upset just like that, speed of light, speed of thought. They would come in and they would say their upset was caused by their husband, caused by the wife, caused by the government, caused by the IRS, the Illuminati, it's the tax, it's this. I'd say, are you really upset with your wife? Absolutely. <laughs> you really upset with your husband, your boyfriend? Absolutely. I'd say, whoa, that's great. Tell me something. How are you pulling that off when they aren't even here? 
they're causing your upset and they're not even in the room. No, it's our mind. By the time they left, all the upsets were gone and none of those people showed up, which is wonderful because it says we're, we have the power, not somebody else. When we blame somebody else, when we blame the government, the IRS, the do 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 yes, there is evil going on. I'm not lessening it in any way. In fact, the atrocities would astound people when they come out. They'll even astound us. The atrocities are unbelievable. But they're well done atrocities. <laughs> See, you smile when you think that. When you go, I'm going to kill them, I'm going to destroy them, you go back into the war game and we all die. So what do we do? There's a mindset. There's a mindset of us as individuals and of the global rulers. What's the mindset? The kids were brought up in what is called the divine right of kings. They were taught a philosophy, a religion. They were taught that it was their right and their duty to control and rule the rest of the world. The story is fascinating. I invite you to go on my website, wonderworldonline.com, and listen to an interview. A person interviewed me on the power structure of the world. It took me 40 years to really learn it and sim simplify it, you know, in terms of what happened. They bought a religion. And they decided to control the finance of the world because if you control the finance of the world, they could control the world through that financing. And they did it really marvelously. Let's all give them a hand. <laughs> Now what's missing is they do not realize that the quality of their life can be far, far, far greater than they ever imagined. That supporting the freedom of individuals, every man, woman, and child on the earth, providing them the means of survival, what they need to survive, guiding them to follow their excitement, to follow their joy, will bring about a society and a culture grander than any that they could ever imagine. The only way we're going to handle the vested interest is to bring them to an awareness that it is in their interest to support the individual freedom of every man, woman, and child on the earth. Now, if you try to educate them, they're not going to listen. <laughs> Not going to work. But if you sneakily entertain them into an awareness of this philosophy, there you go. So, in along with that line, I dreamed up six theme parks, six Disney quality theme parks. One is conceptual designs I totally done. I dreamed up 27 feature films, 16 television programs, 32 video games all incorporating this stuff that are totally fun. They are fun. Fun, fun, fun. Not that I'm going to do them all, but that... I forgot your name. I apologize. That's right, Robert. Robert. Robert did a beautiful, beautiful presentation here. Brilliant. Historical, you know, if you didn't see it, go get the video. Outlining the value and the power of us using entertainment to expand the awareness of people into the idea of how great the life can be if everyone is supporting. They're going to have more joy than they have being a billionaire. Because a billionaire is stuff. And joy doesn't come from stuff. Joy comes from ideas of feeling good. And innately, basically, everybody wants to support everybody else. It's intrinsic, basic. You can get all clouded and confused in all kinds of philosophies. You can get trapped in ideologies, right, and get totally lost. But when you free the individual, they very naturally contribute to everybody else. I found that to be true. If we can expand that consciousness, then we're going to have the world that we're looking for. And in along with that line, I designed a theme park. There's a land in the theme park, you know, like Disneyland, it's got all these lands. There's a land called Long, Long Ago. Long, Long Ago. And what you do is you travel with this 1,400-year-old codger, old Doc Fowler. 
been all over the universe, you know, and seen it all, you know. All kinds of people, all kinds of conflicts, so on and so forth. How he resolved them, how he learned to get along with everybody, how he learned to stay happy no matter what was or was not going on in life. He learned responsibility. Responsibility. The ability to respond in a feel good way to anything that does or does not happen in life. Responsibility, the ability to respond in a feel good way to anything that does or does not happen in your life. I'm still working on it, but boy, it's doable. Old Doc Fowler will give you the lessons that he learned. You'll exit into Old Galaxy Village where you can find Barney's used flying objects, right? There's this car salesman selling used flying objects. You know, this one here has got a laser and a phaser. Hey, you're in a traffic jam. They're history. You're on your way. You know, that kind of thing. Benny's Alien Pet Pet Store, where you can get replicas of, of the actual pets from different civilizations. And kids are taught to the proper care and handling of alien creatures with the motivation of that, that if they do it good enough, they might get an actual alien creature. You know, that kind of thing. Next door to that is the land of the dragons. You'll be able to fly, talk, discuss philosophy with libertarian dragons. <laughs> we put actors in what's called Waldo, and as they move, the dragon moves, you know, and you can discuss philosophy with them. And you get the, the whole history of the dragons, the dragons of wisdom. Oh and how the dragons of war got born. Somebody one day got an idea of a thing called conflict. Hadn't existed before that, you know. And a whole sort of conflicts developed. And out of that was born the dragons of war. And then the dragons of wisdom created the dragons of play <laughs> to kind of get people back to stop being so serious and warlike and start smiling and feeling good again. You know, right? We get all these philosophies going. Next to that is Atlantis and the water humans. I used to take people out for wild dolphin swims. We'd sit on the beach. I didn't know if you could really do this. Whoa, whoa, we'll contact the dolphins. Whoa. Yeah, oh, no worry. I've been called a weirdo all my life. And I looked it up in the dictionary. It says, standing out is different from the ordinary. I went, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> you won't be weirdo. That'll feel good, right? How it depends on the slant you put on it, right? Atlantis and the water humans. There's a, there's a section of the theme park, this particular land, where the dolphins have their own lake. No humans allowed. That's connected to another lake. Humans are allowed over there. You have the dolphin telepathy theater. And you learn to put out vibrations of love and caring and real affinity, not the fake sweetie kind of affinity, but real genuine caring and love, like you feel for your loved ones and your family. And this attracts the dolphins, because one of their primary characteristics is love. And they come and swim with you and snorkel with you. And if they don't, you go back into down to wisdom theater and learn a little more love. <laughs> a lot more to it. There's Atlantis and the water humans, where, where, where we, we have the legend that the dolphins and the land humans live side by side, sharing community of liberty with each other. Next to that is United Earth. And in United Earth we have the Conflicts Resolution Theater. And in the theater we dramatize theatrical productions that demonstrate that it is in the interest of the powers that be to support all mankind. Because that when they do, the quality of their life is far greater. We don't tell them that. We do theatrical productions that say that. You got a four-armed alien that's sitting there <coughs> doing interplanetary news. Right? He says you wouldn't believe what's going on on Earth. You know, a lot, a lot of humor, a lot of fun, a lot of joke. You can sit around at the craft saucer salad bar <coughs> and discuss philosophy. The aliens are landing and teleporting in and claiming that they had all the problems we have and they found the answer. And the answer lie in joy and fun and neatness. In learning to respond in a feel-good way. 
I think that's a lesson we all can learn. I'm still learning it every single day. I, I do not claim to be a master in any way, shape, or form. I learn it every day. My wife went through three and a half years of battling breast cancer and then died. It was pure hell. And trying to learn to smile through that, I'm still learning. But to be sad, it has its place. To feel bad, to be depressed, I went into depression. I didn't even know I was in depression. I went to the doctor, he gives me this exam, depression. I scored very high. <laughs> <laughs> Top marks, right? And so I started writing a book called The Joys of Deep Depression. <laughs> Where's the joys? Where are they? Because what is depression? Depression is the idea there is no value anymore. In the theme park, there's a pavilion called emotions. Emotions. When you enter it, you enter into a huge pre-show area. And in that pre-show area, the gamut of human emotions are being projected motion picture-wise in an oval all around you. <clears throat> Everything from the most glorious emotion down to the most base, cruel, insane human emotions. And as you're watching that, a beautiful woman materializes in the middle of the road. Women are wonderful. Like Belafonte said, the woman is smarter. Smarter than the man in every way. Because the woman has the emotion, the feeling. It far outstrips the intellect. Yes, the intellect brings us the technology, but not the feelings. And in it, in this pavilion, when you go into the ride, you meet, prof you meet Professor Feely, who is teaching a class of aliens what humans have to think in order to feel the emotions that they feel. Value, he says, value. Value is the key. Humans value things. They value their wife their husband, their dog, their wallet, their money. And when they have the idea that that value might go away, they feel fear. If they feel they value their arm, everybody please put up your arm because some people get a little dopey. Put up your arm like they go, ooh, ooh, ooh. See, you know, how, many, how many people value your arm? Put your arm up, please. You value it, right? See, if a tiger comes, it's going to take away that value. You feel fear, terror, <laughs> right? You, they, if you have the idea that some, something you want will not occur, I, mean, we're not, I don't know if we'll ever make it, as Liber told me. And Liber told you, what are we anyway? How do you can't even pronounce the word. You know, how are we going to change the world? You know, I don't know. It will never happen. You get nervous. What's nervous? In form of, Fear, that the idea that value will not occur or value will go away. When you have the idea that the value is gone, you feel sad. The value is gone. Country songs all about that. You know. She's gone. I'm just listening to Buddy Holly you know, last night. You know. She's gone. You know, she's valued and she's gone. You feel sad. When there's no value whatsoever, nothing seems valuable anymore. You got apathy. Just about death. When you feel that somebody else, some of those damn son of a bitches, are screwing up our country and screwing up the value and the liberty of mankind, and we're gonna kill them, son of bitches. And our anger is you think somebody else is preventing you from having the value. That's what anger is. You assign the cause outside of self. Never works. And enthusiasm is feeling that the value is present. Everybody secretly look around and see people that you like, how they look, and you don't have to do it quick. You don't have to do it quick. See, and we start smiling. What do you do? You put your attention on value. Ooh, oh, there's a valuable thing on her. Valuable smile. Beautiful. That lady with a beautiful smile. Very genuine, very caring, very real, not artificial. Ooh, nice. That's what the Wonder Project is all about. We have the ability to live free in the world as it is. We accept it as it is. 
not fight it, not protest it, not fear it, not even try to change it. We don't want to try to change it. What we want to do is create what we want. See? You go, oh, you did a great job of screwing up the world, man. Really nice. You have a great job. Okay, Academy Award for screw up. Screwing up the world. Now let's go make, make it the way we want. Let's go make it better than it ever was. That's the philosophy. That's the idea. George Carlin, one of my favorite comedians, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man, had a brilliant quote. I'm going to make sure I get it exact, so I'm going to pick up my page and quote it here. I love it. Let's see if I can find it. I'm not quoting it if I can't find it. But if I can find it, I'll quote it. But if I can't but if I do, well, I'm going to wait pages. Wow, God, look at that. Great ideas could be put in there. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the ideas. I'm going to see it on those pages. Where are you, George? I don't know. Where are you? George, are you over here? I don't know. Somewhere. Ah! I think you found me. Huh? Hooray. Oh, you see? You found it. Hooray. I found it. Thank you. Everybody give me a hand. People who see life as anything more than pure entertainment are missing the point. <laughs> Isn't that gorgeous? People who see life as anything more than pure entertainment are missing the point. We got to feel good. We got to feel good no matter what. We're going to visualize the life that we want as if it already occurred and then do what we can to bring it about. And you've got amazing power. You have no idea what the power that you have. It's beginning to open up how unbelievably multidimensional and powerful we are. It's astounding. The game of, oh, I am the little human. What can I do? Is coming to an end. You are amazing, amazing people. Every single one of you. Brilliant, unique, grander than you have ever imagined. You are far, far greater than you ever thought you were. Even in your, oh boy, I'm not cool. Even then, <laughs> far greater. Really, yeah, I'm honest. Wow. I've been blessed to have some of those astounding consciousness expanding experiences. And they, oh, you're, you're, you're the peace that pathos all understanding. I got it once. It's so much so beyond any of my understanding. Whoa, which is exactly what it was. Wow. Love so magnificent you can't translate it in a language. Right? We have that power. The truth is we create the reality we experience. We are our government. Don't keep blaming them, it won't work. Don't war with them, it won't work. That's my opinion. Admire and retire the crap. We're gonna have a whole section called crap retirement. <laughs> Tiring the crap of the world by admiring it. Oh, nicely done crap. <laughs> now somebody gives you an obscene gesture. Boom. What do you do? How do you respond to that? Most people go, oh, how dare you? <laughs> Big negative meaning, upset, fight, war. Right? Negative meaning, negative result on self instantly. But how about if they go, oh, nicely done. Yeah. Hand came up, finger came up, went up, down, very nice. <laughs> no, did it real well. Hey, how do you, you feel good? It's the meaning we assign. Winston Churchill said, most men occasionally stumble over the truth. <laughs> but most pick themselves up and continue on as if nothing had happened. <laughs>
and create a great life. We have the ability, we have the power, and I sincerely believe that. Right? I'm not going to build all these things. I'm not going to make all these movies. They're just ideas that you and others, brilliant people, will take and go forth and uh, give me a run. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Just for fun, because I like it. Oh, here's a, pav a pavilion. I'm not sure if we're going to make this one or not in the theme park. It's called the Upsets, Problems, Stress, Pain, and Misery Pavilion. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's an invitation to admire and retire the pain and the misery, which is a very nice idea. I love Star Wars. How many people Star Wars fans? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and Yoda, Ray, you know, Ray Luke, he raises the ship out. I love that. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, always with you, it cannot be done. Mm Hear -hmm. you nothing of what I say? Master, raising a few rocks, that's one thing. Raising the ship's totally different. No, not different. Who leave your mind? Different. Judge me by my size, do you? And well, you should not, for my ally is the force. And a powerful ally it is. Life creates it. I love that. Life creates it. And life creates the force that we have. All right, I'll try. No! Do or do not. There is no try. <clears throat> if anybody knows George Lucas, uh, intimately or any of the people who worked on a Star Wars program. I have a, a third trilogy outlined. <laughs> <coughs> you know, I'd uh, be very happy to have uh, that happen in real life. Does it have What's that? Does it have Jar Jar? It does not have Jar Jar. <laughs> no Jar Jar. <laughs> Emerging suddenly from hyperspace, we rapidly descend into the atmosphere of the planet Coruscant. And that's the one where the crowns and the governments. Racing low across the surface of the galactic city, we approach the five towers of the Jedi Temple, landing on a platform reserved for members of the High Council, an elderly Luke Skywalker. Walks intently down the gangplank of his one of a kind hyperlink starship, keeping pace just behind him. Two impossibly beautiful members of the Jedi elite sacred feminine core flank him on both sides. The gossamer fabric of their full length matching outfits offers a stark contrast to the skill that seems to permeate through every fiber of their being. Cutting to the interior of the Jedi temple, we slowly circle the ghostly images of Master Yoda, Obi Wan, and Anakin Skywalker as they address all but one of the current High Council members, remember they're all dead, will be my dog in all oats. Master Yoda, be reasonable, one of the Council members exclaims, the conflict has escalated through half of the galaxy. In your mind, the conflict exists, Yoda replies, as he uses his cane to knock on the head of the offending Jedi. Exist it cannot. If it does not first exist in here for a hundred years, have I told you this, and still you hear nothing of what I say. Master Yoda, another member, replies, that's all well and good in theory, but this is reality. This is very real. Believe me, my friend, Anakin gently responds as he taps the hilt of his lightsaber on the head of the Jedi. There is no outside reality if there is not first one in here. Yes, yes, you want a response in hopeful anticipation. To Anakin, you should listen. Return from the dark side, he has. Wisdom he has learned. It's no use, Luke replies, as he strides into the chamber, the missing council member. I've been trying to get that through their po to the po that point through their heads for the last 20 years. Trying you still are, you always says. <laughs> Doing you still have not learned. Yes, I know, Luke responds. I learned that over and over again. And then when the reality gets too intense, I seem to fall back into the old ways. 
focusing on the wrong reality you all are. And this is what I believe is true of us, focusing on the wrong reality we are. We are focusing on the crap. We are focusing on the insanities. We are focusing on the craziness. We are not focusing on really creating the world that we want. We're not focusing on admiring and retiring the crap. As Yoda would say, just focusing on the wrong reality we all are. Yoda insists addressing the council, focus not on this apparency that seems to surround you. He says as he points his staff at the chamber of the compasses, focus on the reality you desire. Empower only the one you desire and gone the conflicts will be. I thank you very much for coming to be with me. You are absolutely wonderful people. This is the first time I got the chance to come to Libertopia. My wonderful, incredibly, marvelous, continuous friend, Paul Gibbons, the guy behind the camera right there, who's been my devoted friend, God, I don't even know how long, still doing stuff, got me to come to Libertopia. And I'm glad to meet you all. And hope that you will consider me your friend, I consider you my friend, and all of you birth wonderful people. Let's cease battling the crap, let's cease opposing people's point of view, let's just acknowledge them as fascinating creations and get on with it. I right, thank you all. I'll hang around if anybody wants to ask any questions, I'll answer them for between um, I only have, um, oh, I would say about 72 hours, uh, that I'm willing to <laughs> answer questions if anybody wants to. Thank <laughs> you.